Throughout my life, my ethnicity has mostly been an afterthought, even to me. Having a Spanish surname might categorize me demographically, but I'm not fluent in the language, and since my ancestors are from Spain, not Latin America, I look nothing like what most Americans consider Hispanic. I used to think that racial and ethnic discrimination was something that was obvious. It was certainly obvious to me when my best friend in elementary school told me that his dad didn't want him to be my friend anymore. But why? My dad said he doesn't want me to be friends with any Mexicans. But I'm not Mexican. I'm American. So are my parents. My grandparents are from Spain. I know it, but it doesn't matter to my dad. I can honestly say that I have experienced ethnic prejudice. And those experiences contributed greatly to my understanding of fairness, my beliefs in social justice and equality. Having personally experienced discrimination, I thought it would always be easy to identify. But my experiences were isolated, triggered only when someone predisposed to racist attitudes learned of my ethnicity. Except for my time in the military, my Spanish surname is not usually on display. And since the typical Spaniards from whom I descended looked no different from any other typical European, I unknowingly benefited from white privilege. I've met white people who would treat me just like any other white guy, with respect, acceptance, and cordiality. That is, right up until my last name enters the equation. Then it becomes clear that in their eyes, I'm just another spick. Not that there's anything wrong with that. My ancestry, my citizenship, even my military service can be irrelevant to someone dedicated to categorizing people as others for the sake of their own sense of superiority. D-money, smoothie, shifty, uh, <laughs> these type of guys. And some, I assume, are good people. With that kind of experience, I would never have thought of myself as a racist person. Yet I grew up in a culture that had structured itself on the subjugation of marginalized groups. And like most people, I was blissfully ignorant of the systemic racism that not only shaped the communities we live in, but the ways we interact with one another, and even how we think about one another. Having been brought up in this culture, many of us are unaware of our own complicity in perpetuating a racist system, and are even afraid of acknowledging it when it's brought to our attention. It has nothing to do with your race. Lest we be labeled racists. Are you racist? I am the least racist person that you have ever met. The first time I was introduced to the concept of racial profiling, I still didn't get it. I was 16 years old, watching The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I remember at the time identifying more with Carlton's initial naive beliefs. They were just doing their job. But I think you've blown this whole thing way out of proportion. Despite the fact that Will predicted every action the cop would take. <laughs> even after everything Phil had said to the police and his son. Dad, if you were a policeman and you saw a car driving two miles an hour, wouldn't you stop it? I asked myself that question the first time I was stopped. I remember thinking, they're blowing this out of proportion. When I got older, I was introduced to the concept of implicit bias and how it informs our racist thinking. Again, I learned about it through popular culture, but being older and more open-minded, I was more receptive to what it meant. Everyone's a little bit racist. I, 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 all right. Like many Americans, after witnessing the election of the first African-American president of the United States, the reality of just how racist American culture still is began to make itself evident. I can't trust Obama. He's an Arab. He is not. I learned about the concept of the dog whistle. Misogyny is bigotry in the form of a language so coded that only the person it's targeting is insulted by it like a dog whistle. It lets them get away with it. On this network alone, Olivia Pope has been described as lucky, sassy, ambitious, well-spoken, well-mannered, articulate, drill, calculating, overconfident, secretive. While the president is obviously a great orator. Urban, hot-blooded, known to use thug politics, arrogant, a siren. Words like these mean nothing to the general public, which is why the media can get away with using them. I was reintroduced to the concept of racial profiling by the police, again through popular culture, and made more palatable by humor. So go ahead and treat us like you would if I weren't the president. <laughs> Not exactly what I had in mind. I then learned about a phenomenon that I had never been aware of before. I am William George Bailey Jones. 
I'm 13 years old, and I have nothing to harm you. That's good, baby. You always have to show the police where your hands are and always say what you're doing before you do it. Up to this point in my life, every time that I had heard about parents giving their kids the talk, I assumed that it was that awkward conversation between parent and child about the birds and the bees. Where do babies come from anyhow? Why, mothers bring them into the world. But why do mothers bring them? Johnny, by the grace of heaven, mothers are the only ones who know how to bring babies into the world. That's right, Dad. A casual poll of white Americans reinforces this popular understanding of the phrase. Talk, the talk of um, sexuality and um, what happens with your body and all of that type of thing, then yes, that's what... I think of as the talk. Uh, parents talking about their kids, uh, with their kids about the birds and the bees. Of course, asking people of color the exact same question elicits a very different response. That was probably the first time I had to talk with my mother. She actually sat me down and explained to me the interactions of authority, any type of authority figure, but mainly someone with a badge. When I got to a certain age, I started telling younger kids um, who were 13, 14 years old, we would be driving around with them and the cops would pull us over and they would say, oh, they're pulling us over because we're black or we're Hispanic, they're pulling, and we would just be like, look, just do what they say. Don't try to do some civil rights thing right now. Just comply with them and we'll all be on our way. When you get pulled over, say, keep your hand on the wheel, because you know they're going to be edgy. Keep your hand on the wheel so they can see it and keep all your information in the, you know, in the, in the visor, not in the, not, don't put it in the glove compartment, because if you go reaching for that, then they get all edgy and think you're getting a gun or something. So no, put it in the visor so they can see your hands and you can give them the information. So the talk was about how I should react if I'm pulled over by an officer. I didn't know that. It's a little sad that that's something that has to be specified as a talk. I guess, I mean, it's obviously unfortunate that you know, some of those guys have to go through um, that, but, yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't really thought about it, so I don't really have an opinion or uh, really deep thoughts about it, to be honest with you. I can't speak for the feelings of those that we interviewed, but speaking for myself, I can honestly say that I felt ashamed for not knowing this basic truth about African American culture. I'm not talking about stereotypical white guilt, which can be perceived as an affectation. Publicly demonstrating an exaggerated degree of horror at any mention of social injustice, I'm talking about real shame for thinking of myself as a thoughtful and caring person, while at the same time being completely oblivious to what has been a sad and even terrifying fact of life for so many people all around me. I'm also simultaneously grateful and embarrassed that I had to rely on popular culture to educate me about it. My friends are saying things, are mouthing off. Know that you cannot. That I'm just as guilty of living in a bubble of cultural isolation and ignorance as a lot of other people are. Because the talk goes on in every black household. When you get pulled over. Um, I'm a good driver. Okay. Baby, don't worry. This is not about you getting a ticket. This is about you not coming home. Since my personal experiences with discrimination were isolated, I just assumed that it was that way for everyone. I did not have a clear understanding of what it meant to live with discrimination, to feel that constant anxiety that comes with being a person of color in a society that espouses equality, but still doesn't honestly practice it. The term woke has been a part of African American political vernacular since the 1960s. It has seen a resurgence in the 21st century, and refers to a perceived awareness of issues concerning social justice and racial equality. Of course, I want to be perceived as being aware of social justice and racial equality issues, but despite having only been made recently aware of problems that have existed right in front of me my entire life, it would not be appropriate, or perhaps indicative of cultural appropriation, to make any claim of being woke especially knowing that I can still be influenced by implicit biases based on systemically ingrained racial prejudice and not even know it. I hope that I'm at least redeemed by my willingness to be called out on it, 
that I'm open to being educated about any socially insensitive faux pas that I might unknowingly commit. It's for that reason that I've decided to attempt to coin a phrase that can be considered culturally adjacent and not culturally appropriated. Woke, but drowsy.